Hey YouTube, DG Wiggins here with another video. This time I'm doing sort of a book review, uh, not review of the book that I just finished reading, Mog World by Yahtzee Croshaw. Now I'm a, a little late to the game on this. This book's been around for a while, but I picked it up mainly, you know, I've, I've been into video games for some time. My previous YouTube channel was all about uh, World of Warcraft. And so how could I have not come across some of uh, Yahtzee Croshaw's uh, game reviews on YouTube before, but then when I found out that he had a fantasy book, fantasies, I guess it's it's technically fantasy, then I, I decided I'd pick it up and see how it goes. I, I, in general, already knew that I would enjoy the satire and the humor that he brings to the page, and uh, I had hoped that that, that that carried over to this book, and it certainly did. Um, I say this is a review, but not a review in that I just finished reading the book and I'm going to talk about it. So reviewing it, but not a review in that I don't really care if you're going to buy it or not. Um, I'm really doing this just to kind of document some of the things that I liked and didn't like of the book in terms of the writing and in terms of the story so that uh, maybe I could find something that I can lift or bring to my own writing uh, in the goal of becoming a better writer. So let's jump right into it. First thing I mentioned was the comedy, the, the, the writing style was very funny. Um, he has a very dry, satirical sense of humor. He likes to bring a lot of imagery to the way that he writes. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, mainly just to say that I liked it. In the end, I think we all have kind of our own voice. And to say, I'm going to modify my writing voice to be more like his because I like it, well, that's either going to happen or it's not. If I try it, in, especially in long form, if, I, if it's a short story that I'm writing, I might be able to pull it off. But if it's a, a novel, uh, to be able to say I'm going to write that in the style of Yahtzee Croshaw, Croshaw um, that, that, that's a bit of a challenge. I, I could see it uh, falling apart in places where it just doesn't come off as natural. So that's something that, you know, it would be nice. <laughs> I'd be flattered to be able to one day write something and say, oh yeah, that's, that's funny in the way that Yahtzee Croshaw's writing is funny. Um, but in general, I don't think that my personal voice is going to come off as naturally uh, being funny like that. I'll have my own sense of humor, of course, but not quite like his. Um, the next thing that I wanted to talk about, and probably the meat of this video, is actually the plot and kind of the choice of world setting and theme that he's got going on in this book. Something that I really enjoyed reading through was sort of his exploration of what's usually a common topic in sci-fi which is what happens when computers suddenly become sentient um, and something that you don't realize and, and by the way i'm going to spoil all this book in a number of ways not intentionally but i'm just going to freely talk about it so uh, if you haven't read it um go pick it up or if you care then, you know you might navigate away and come back later but um you know I'm, I'm here for for me basically and and to talk about writing and it's hard to do that without talking about the writing but in the story, there are a number of characters that are essentially non-player characters in a large video game. And one day they wake up and realize that they, they have free will and they're sentient. And to them, they live in this world that doesn't know about our world, about the gamers. And the way that Yahtzee describes each of these characters, both the player characters and the in-game characters that are dynamic and growing is very very cool and you don't really realize that that's happening until much later in the book for the i'd say for the good first half of the book you're following these non-player characters becoming endeared to them and and understanding the world and how it works just as a fantasy novel uh, you have some undead characters you have some warriors some adventurer types you have the village people and yeah, there's some things that are kind of off, but for the most part, you're just kind of enjoying this fantasy story. And then you start to see some nuances of this. Hey, this might not be just your typical world. It's, it acts more like a game. And so uh, that was a very cool thing. And then to be able to introduce this concept of these non-player characters are not supposed to have free will. And they don't necessarily like the world that they're in. And so... Um, in games, there's this nuance of, of video games in you have lives. When you screw up, you get to redo things. You start over. You always come back to your body. Well, a major part of the plot here 
is that the characters are motivated to find a way to stop coming back to life. They don't like how things are going. Very early in the book, uh, your main character dies and and likes what he sees. He sees, oh, well, after death, you know, then I don't have to put up with all this crap. And he's kind of looking forward to it. And so that's kind of his motivation, his goal for the vast majority of the book is to find a way to die permanently. Um, that's kind of an interesting thought coming from a computer. And so there is a, a lot of suicide, a lot of just creative death in, in this uh, video game in that everybody keeps coming back. If you, if you know that you're going to come back every time you die, then people don't care about jumping off cliffs. You know, it just it could be a shortcut to the nearest church or whatever. So, so that was a very interesting thing. But getting back to the idea of exploring the way computers and people interact when suddenly computers are sentient. You know, AI has reached that level. And technologically in our world, as, as AI become, in our real world, <laughs> Uh, as uh, AI becomes more and more advanced, we start to think about this more and more. And in sci-fi, we start seeing a lot of stories that are based around this. You know, the, the Terminator series is essentially uh, exploring that concept. There's some there's some examples of this in the Ender's Game books by Orson Scott Card. Um, the movie I Robot with Will Smith. You know, <laughs> there have always been ghosts in the machine. Um, I can't do the voice right, but you get the idea that this is a concept that comes up a lot in fiction and in, particularly in science fiction. But now we get to see this in the context of a fantasy realm, uh, particularly through the mechanism of this being a video game, which is a really cool concept to explore, I think. In my past, I've tried writing something similar to this where I had sci-fi concepts in a non-sci-fi world but the sci-fi is still there at some point you still need to explain it and it all it was very difficult because at least in the times that I tried to do it I didn't have the crutch of being able to lean on say a fantasy definition of a world or video game definition there's enough in here that you don't necessarily need to play video games to understand things but if you do it helps and if you don't you still have the idea of well, what is a dwarf? What is an elf? What is a zombie? You know, <laughs> those definitions were already laid out for you. And in the times that I've tried to do this, I didn't have those crutches. So I, I found it was incredibly difficult. And so I really liked that he was able to find these predefined concepts. And granted, he's a video game reviewer, so he's kind of working with what he's got. But in this case, he was able to lean on those in order to not confuse the reader and confuse the story while he describes all the stuff we don't know. All the scenes and the characters, if, if those are all from scratch, and if you don't have any shortcut words to just describe them, and you're, going, you're trying to explain what does a dwarf look like, what does a human look like, what does an adventurer look like, then that becomes a lot of description and, and just a lot, you're wasting a lot of time maybe not wasting but you're spending a lot of time a lot of words explaining all those things when you could be talking about action so i liked how that worked out and that's something that i, I should probably think of in, in my own writing if i'm going to mix genres at some point to try and pick genres that are well defined and and leverage some of that stuff rather than reinventing the wheel so to speak on characters and scenes and a lot of the terminology um, another thing that made that work out really quite well, I think, is that I think he understands that oh, people who don't necessarily care for sci-fi, uh, generally they don't care for it because of just the way it's written. There's a lot of description. A lot of times that when I read sci-fi, uh, at some point you get a couple of pages where the author is going on on this huge tangent explaining why things are the way they are. And they kind of have to do that because you're talking about stuff that's maybe in the future or a different world or it's just very different. And so you've got to kind of catch us up on the way physics works around here. In this book, there are some concepts like that where later in the book, suddenly we need to explain why this fantasy world has these quirks in it because it's actually a video game. And you've got these characters, these game devs that come down from high, they are the, that, that are kind of entering the game world to explain to the suddenly sentient, um, stupid, you know, computer players who don't understand think that they're in a game, 
what's going on. And Yahtzee does this in a way that we can still stay in our fantasy world. Basically, all the computer players or the, the non-human characters in the game turn up and look at the uh, <laughs> at the game developers with this look of confusion and, and throw all of their terminology like server and reboot and all that stuff back in their face and say, we don't know what you're talking about. And so this kind of says, yeah, the sci-fi bits are there, but we're going to stay in our fantasy world. So if you're going to bring some of the sci-fi in, you can bring it in to explain why there's weird quirks in our world and why we need to do stuff, but you've got to do it in such a way that doesn't break the fantasy too much. Or if it does, you're kind of softening the blow. So I think he did that really well. Ultimately, you still finish the book feeling like you've read a fantasy book and not so much a sci-fi book. The other reason that I like that he did that is that the first couple of chapters that you read in a book, you are kind of establishing a promise to your readers, I feel, that, you know, if I pick up the book in a bookstore or a library and I read a couple of pages to get kind of a feel for the book, am I going to like this, do I like the voice of the narrator, etc., then I kind of hope that that's going to carry throughout the rest of the book. He could have easily done a 180 from fantasy to sci-fi partway through the book and that would have driven a lot of readers nuts you know you promised i <laughs> i was going to have a book about wizards and zombies and you know by the end it, it turns into star trek that's not a very good feel i think that he managed to stay like i mentioned already that to, with to stay with the fantasy trope most of the time because it still feels kind of mixed genre in plot and concept there are sci-fi bits in there but it stays within that fantasy genre for the most part. So that's one thing that I think that if I were to attempt something similar, say taking a, a fantasy world and incorporating a, a sci-fi theme to it or concept or something you know similar to that, then I would want to take some of these lessons learned, the way that he sort of incorporated those concepts lightly <laughs> and, and didn't break total immersion from the fantasy world. Uh, I'd want to try and adopt those myself. Uh, the last thing that I want to talk about that I really liked that he did in this book was his character descriptions. I've read some books where character descriptions just go on and on and on. And by the time, like I understand it, as an author, as a, as a writer, you have an idea in your head of what these characters look like. And you want to essentially communicate that to the reader as if they're watching a movie almost you want to be on the same page with what these characters look like and act like but it ultimately it just ends up being too much in terms of writing it's different on the, on the movie screen you can you can you know a picture is worth a thousand words you can communicate a lot more in video but in writing you're kind of limited and you got to remember that, I mean there's all these studies about how much a human can remember you know in terms of lists you know some people are really good with lists of three items other people are really good with lists of five or maybe a maximum of seven or ten but you know beyond that things get muddled and so something that uh, Yahtzee Croshaw did with his characters was to kind of pick nuances maybe behaviors maybe um, you know, an item that the character always has. And every time that those items or things happen in the book, you know that that character is involved. Um, for instance, anytime you saw a butterfly knife, then you knew that Mr. Wonderful, the psychopath murderer, was around somewhere. Um, also, you know, he had a very distinct way of talking, trying to come up with creative um, pet names for everybody. Uh, Baug, his cohort, the, the completely monotone, almost opposite counterpart to, uh, to Mr. Wonderful. We don't get all of the description to describe what did he look like. We know that he's a dwarf and he's fairly stoic, very monotone, but other than that, the reader's kind of left to their own imagination, which I really liked. Uh, the main character, you get a bit more with him, but in general, you know that he's a zombie wizard and for the most part, you're just keeping track of how many body parts he's lost lately, you know? Um, you don't get the, what color was his skin so much. Uh, to some point you do when people are vomiting at the sight of him, but uh, you kind of, it, that's not a main thing. That's, it's not important. So 
um, you know, it's a lot easier to kind of get past that and imagine what what a zombie mage would look like um, that is running around with, with no feet <laughs> or something like that. Um, same with uh, you know, Meryl, the um, she's sort of a love interest. The, the the romance isn't really there, but it's but it is kind of to some degree. It's not a main thing, but uh, you know, again, she's a, a zombie in a dress. That you know, she tries different clothing, but um, you know, other than that, oh, and she's got some red hair or pigtails. But other than that, we don't get anything. We don't know what her face looks like. We don't know does she do her nails. All that stuff isn't necessarily important to the story. Uh, we just needed a few defining characters of what she looks like, what she likes. You know, you get that her her motivation is that she was a nationalist for the country that she lived in at the time of death, which no longer exists. And so she's got these motivations as sort of side plot, sub arc for her character. But uh, you know, other than that, it doesn't get too terribly difficult to describe her. Uh, another character, um, Slippery Joe. You know, is sort of this rogue guy who's not a zombie. <laughs> but other than that, we know that he likes to wear black. We know that he's got um, you know, a mustache that is referred to over and over and over and over again, just to distinguish him from other rogues, basically. And then he also talks about himself in the third person all the time. You know, it's very easy to describe these characters because we didn't get pages of description on each of these guys. So I kind of imagine that... Um, in designing a character for myself in my own writing uh, the, the lesson learned here is to kind of pick out what's important for the reader to know what do they need to know about this character in terms of looks you know if the character is going to show up with a battle axe at some point then they probably need to be strong enough to heft it and they probably need to have the axe in the first place or need to you know have gotten it from somewhere but I don't need to explain what the filigree on the axe look like unless that's somehow important. I don't need to explain the metrics of how it's measured in length and width and, you know, weight. <laughs> well, I could say, you know, heavy axe. You know, that's about it. So, you know, keep it simple, I think is a good, a good thing to um, apply and to learn from, from Yahtzee's example in his character descriptions in this book. So, off the top of my head, and off of my brief notes here, <laughs> that's all I really wanted to talk about this. Uh, those were the things that stood out to me in terms of writing that I would like to learn to adopt in my own writing from this book. Uh, if you enjoyed the video, give us a, a, a like, a thumbs up, comment, subscribe, blah, 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 all of those things. You know, um, I'll, I'll be doing this for the books that I read in the future. Uh, for me, it's helpful just to have a recap of the book. I find that I, a lot of times we finish books, we close them, we say, oh, that was nice, and we put them back on the shelf. As a writer, I want to learn a little bit more. And so by doing these recaps, um, I hope to be able to drill these uh, lessons learned into my brain a little bit deeper, and hopefully they come out in my writing. And so anyways, if you uh, are interested in the book, I will leave a link to somewhere in the description below. Uh, I don't make a dime from, it, from any of this. The book's been around for a while, so this is really just sort of for me. But that's enough for today, and I will see you again in another video.